and thank you for joining us on Giving Voice to Depression. I'm Bridget. And I'm Terry. More than 350 million people worldwide suffer from depression, but you do not have to have it yourself to be affected by it. Its prevalence pretty much guarantees that someone you care about battles its darkness. This podcast tries to shine some light into that darkness. We're not experts and we're not therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and are committed to encouraging healthy, healing conversations about mental illness. Episodes in this season are made possible by a grant from the Charles E. Kubley Foundation, which is dedicated to bettering the lives of those affected by depression. We are solely responsible for podcast content. Hi, Bridget. Hi, Terry. September is Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. So there's always a lot of talk about the need for early education, for new legislation, the incredible need to eliminate stigma, means restrictions on bridges, and all the other topics that come up around the subject. Mm -hmm. Our focus in today's podcast and last week's as well is what we can do, each of us, in our own family and social circles how specifically we can reach out and offer support to someone who's struggling with a mental health challenge so that we can hopefully head off a crisis or suicide attempt. Because we can't wait for or even rely on legislation or a doctor or a therapist if we're the ones who know the person well enough to notice that they're not doing well, that maybe they're isolating more or they're talking about death in a way that, I don't know, uh, doesn't sound so philosophical anymore maybe. It is, as one of our doctor guests once put it, our human responsibility to step in and be there for each other. Mm -hmm. So today in part two of how to offer help and support someone who's struggling, we continue our interview with Sam Dillon Finch, who compiled a list of 11 important ways loved ones supported him during mental health crises. In other words, these are not things he thinks could help, but things he knows did. We begin this second part with the sixth way they helped. They did not lecture him about what treatment was best. I have yet to meet someone with mental illness who hasn't had some kind of complaint around this. Mm -hmm. I think everyone likes to think they know what's best for someone. And it's usually yoga? It's almost always yoga. Yeah, I think so too. (laughs) It's almost always yoga or like meditation or things that are like certainly helpful, but they're not the be all end all and they're not right for everyone. Right. So I think folks have an over-reliance of telling people to essentially, you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And then they have a tendency to criticize things that we actually know from clinical research is very helpful for some folks. So things like medication and therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's weird that we put such an overemphasis on stuff that requires you to be mentally healthy in order to be able to really do it. And then we criticize the stuff that exists for folks who just don't have a healthy enough baseline to be able to really participate in life. Because in all honesty, no matter how well you know someone, you don't know what their capacity is for participating in some of the things that you're recommending unsolicited advice can just be really frustrating, even if it's great advice. Uh, Folks may just not be in a position where they want to hear that at that point. And more often than not, it's not our first episode or whatever word we want to use. And, you know, asking us what has worked in the past can be a lot more useful than telling us what you think will work in the present. Absolutely. The redundancy of the advice that we get is frustrating because it's not our first rodeo. (laughs) Like we've been through this more than likely multiple times before. And given the fact that the age of onset for mental illness is often really young, most of us have had lots of experience dealing with these things. The seventh way Sam's support system really comes through for him, and we can do to come through for someone we care about, is help them navigate the mental health system. You would be hard-pressed to find a person with some kind of mental health challenge that's not frustrated with the mental health system even under the best of circumstances, because it's complicated and messy and really difficult to navigate. I think that there are folks who don't have experience with this, who think that once you realize you have a mental health problem, you just go and get a therapist or you go and get a psychiatrist and bada bing, like two weeks later you emerge and you're totally fine. And it's just not at all like that. There are delays, there are tons of phone calls you often have to make 
You have to deal with insurance, which is notoriously awful to deal with, assuming you even have insurance. And if you don't, you have to find services that will still help you. Uh, it's, it's a mess. And I think that if you're already in a difficult place, the idea of having to dig through that mess is just awful. Help can look like sharing the name of a good therapist or doctor you or someone you know is working with, going on the Internet to research which providers take your friend's insurance, picking up their prescription, making the calls to see if a psychiatrist or medical doctor is taking new patients, or scheduling an appointment and driving them to it. If an emergency room visit is necessary, go with the person and be their advocate. And it was essential for me, too, as someone who often appears to be, quote unquote, high functioning, to have people in the emergency room with me. Because oftentimes the nurses and doctors that I interacted with, even the social workers, seemed to think I was a lot better than I actually was. So I was not always my best advocate in those situations. So having loved ones there who were able to say, no, you know, I have been staying in his apartment the last two days and I am afraid to leave him alone. That can be the difference between getting the care that you need and being sent home. Because so often if they suspect that you're not, quote unquote, sick enough, uh, they're very reluctant to admit you. And with mental health especially, you never know who you're going to be interacting with and what kind of attitudes they have towards folks with mental illness. Mm -hmm. And that just adds a whole other layer of fear to it. Number eight on the list is that Sam's support team worked hard to keep his trust, even when they didn't approve of his choices. Yeah, so this one is tricky, I recognize, because it's getting into kind of murky territory that I think makes people uncomfortable, but I still think it's important to talk about. The example that I include is substance abuse. Depressive disorders often cause acutely uncomfortable feelings, such as overwhelming sadness, hopelessness, and isolation. And it's very common for people to self-medicate. The predicament that it introduces if you criticize someone for making those choices or you judge them too harshly, they're more likely to isolate themselves. It's not likely to get them to change their behavior that's dangerous. It's just more likely to get them to reject support. And that becomes dangerous in the sense that if someone's abusing substances, but they no longer feel that they can reach out to anyone when they're in that frame of mind, it could lead to a really tragic situation where there could be an overdose involved or there could be some kind of dangerous circumstance where they're somewhere by themselves and they can't get home. Uh, It just introduces a lot of scenarios that are really dangerous. Sam offers some responses that leave the door open. They are context dependent, he says, and include, do you have a plan for what you'll do differently next time you're feeling this way? Can I help you come up with one? More often than not, risk-taking is accompanied by impulsivity. And oftentimes we have a tendency to romanticize the choice because we think about what it immediately gives us instead of the long-term consequences. So for me and drinking, it was like, well, when I started drinking, I felt better, Mm -hmm. but then I didn't really stop drinking and then there were consequences. But in my mind, I could only really think about the initial feeling I had of feeling better. And that was all that I wanted in that moment. But when you're able to engage in those conversations and look at the bigger picture and start to unpack the patterns uh, and what other options exist for you in those moments, it's it's progress, right? Mm-hmm. It's not always going to fix things immediately. And oftentimes when you talk about things like substance abuse, it's a long-term process. But you start to realize that there are other paths you can take in the long term to start to deal with these behaviors and that you're not you know, without options in any of the situations that you've been assuming that you were. Another constructive comment is, I am not here to judge you. I just want to figure out how to keep you safe. Uh, Just emphasizing that there's no judgment is so important because we're already judging ourselves, guaranteed. We are already judging ourselves, especially if there were consequences involved, especially if we hurt someone in the process. A third question to maintain both trust and safety is, if there's a next time, can you give me a list of three people you'll contact before you act? And it doesn't mean that I would call that person and say, I really want to get drunk. It's just having that connection. 
sometimes keeping yourself safe isn't always about opening up about what you're feeling. It's just about delaying behaviors that could be really toxic. So if it buys you some amount of time, that's still really valuable. Uh, it gives you more time to think through what those options might be or to just let those feelings pass over you, which is so often what we have to do when we have those impulses because they're very hardwired more often than not, especially when you talk about something like substance abuse. Number nine on Sam's list of 11 important ways he's been successfully supported through a mental health crisis is that his loved ones kept checking in with him, even when he seemed better. And I think in general, appearances can be deceiving. I know for myself, when I start to feel like I'm putting too much of a burden on someone, uh, I might not be so forthcoming about when I start to get depressed again, because I might feel that I have exhausted my resources. And so I'm less likely to share, you know, it's happening again. Or I might just feel ashamed. I think a lot of people, when they do start to feel better and then things get worse again, it can feel like a personal failure. It can feel like, oh, I thought I had it figured out and now I'm doing worse again. And I might be reluctant to admit uh, and throw medications into the mix and it becomes even more complicated because we know that medications can change things really quickly uh, and in unexpected ways. So there's really no reliable way to know for sure that someone has improved in the ways that you might assume without checking in with them and really asking them how they're doing, regardless of how they appear to be doing. There is also the heartbreaking fact that a sudden feeling of calm or even happiness can be a sign a person has made a plan to end their suffering. Sam addresses that more in his article, to which we will link. Number 10 on his list makes the distinction between a support person needing to take a break and doing what feels like abandonment to the friend in need. And I do think there's a way in most situations to step back from offering support to someone that will not have nearly the devastating impact that simply disappearing can have on someone. Some suggestions for how to accomplish that include saying, My life is getting a little bit hectic right now. I'm not sure how reliable I'll be in the next couple of weeks. What other forms of support do you have in place? Again, whenever possible, if you're going to step back, it's important to make sure there's support in place that you're not the only person that was that person's support. Because even though it's not your fault that you've been positioned as this like solo savior, uh, that means it's kind of a dangerous situation. Sam lists several other ways to approach the discussion. But again, the goal is to take the break you need as a caregiver, to recharge and take care of your own stuff, while making clear to the person who's struggling that you still care and are not disappearing. But it can be as simple as saying, you know, this isn't a reflection at all about how much I care about you, but I'm running low on energy. Uh, I want to make sure you're okay, though. Who else is supporting you? It really does make a difference so that that person knows that that support is still there. Uh, it's just not immediately available in the way that it was before. And that really is a significant difference because it's the difference between losing a point of contact for an amount of time versus feeling like you've lost someone in your life. Number 11, another important way to offer support to someone in a mental health crisis is not to wait for them to ask for help. I really wish that more people felt empowered to just check in with people just because. Uh, you don't have to wait for some kind of like red flag to be lifted. You don't have to wait for someone to cry out for help in a way that's obvious because so often people don't. Vulnerability is hard in and of itself. And then magnify that with some kind of stigmatized mental health condition. And you will find more often than not that people are very reluctant to ask for help. But since you are listening to this, you obviously care and want to help. You're trying to learn like we are. And we can all be part of changing the dynamic and breaking the stigma. Start anywhere. If someone seems withdrawn, sad, different than usual, check in. If Sam's suggestions don't resonate with you, say what you wish someone would say to you if the roles were reversed. Even just, hey, if you need to talk to someone, I'm here. I think that folks have a lot of hesitation around having these conversations and it's understandable hesitation. 
because these aren't conversations that we naturally are taught to have or encouraged to have. But I think what gives me a lot of hope is that we get to decide and create what's normal. So if more of us are willing to reach out in this way and more of us are normalizing, engaging in this way, we are actively creating a world where that becomes more acceptable and that becomes more normal to do. So I I try to remind people as often as possible that even if checking in in this way doesn't come naturally to you, and even if it feels kind of weird, you are kind of becoming the role model, the possibility model for how we can cultivate these relationships with people and how we can support each other. And the more of us that become willing to do that, the safer people will be and the more supported people will be, which I think is ultimately what everybody would want. Oh, man. Oh, Sam, you model normalizing mental illness in a way that helps me understand what normalizing really is. That the comment at the end there, the more of us who are willing to check in, the more of us who are willing to have these conversations, the safer people will be, the more supported people will feel. It's uh, it's what we're talking about. That's suicide prevention on a one-on-one, boots on the ground, look next to you, look across from you level. Yep. Be brave, be real. And, you know, it certainly can look like pulling somebody back from the edge of a bridge, but it's also any action or any word that just creates that personal connection, you know, that it lets the person know that they've been seen and that they're valued, that they matter and that they're worth your time and your care and your attention. And not just in September, always. Right. Absolutely. And his comment that you are not without options in any of the situations you've been assuming you were. And if that's not, um, you know, a realization or a truth that could prevent suicide, I really don't know what is. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Sam. So this is his second, and there were the two earlier episodes as well. So we'll be linking to this full list of 11 suggestions as well as the previous episodes. Great. And thank you, Bridget. We will continue these discussions next week with another guest. We hope that these shared stories bring out a little more understanding or help people articulate their experiences of depression a little more clearly or more freely. Thanks to all, everyone who's digging deep and finding the words and finding the courage to give voice to depression. You can find all the other episodes, some resources, and a blog on our website, givingvoicetodepression.com. And you can find the podcast most of the other places that you find podcasts. Just Google it, as our mom says. And please remember, if you're hurting, speak up. If someone else is hurting, listen up.